So we have all different types of cells in the body and this video is going to specifically focus on the development of neurons and all cells start basically from a stem cell. A neural stem cell is a self renewing multi-potential cell that gives rise to neurons and glia. It aligns the neural tube and it has an extensive capacity for self renewal. So neural stem cells are particularly important for the brain. The subventricular zone, this lining of the neural stem cells surrounding the ventricles in adults. So even in our adult brain, there are still some uh, neural stem cells in the subventricular zones of the brain. And a progenitor cell, this is a precursor cell derived from a stem cell. It migrates and produces a neuron or a glial cell. And it produce non-dividing cells known as neuroblasts and glioblasts. So stem cell can differentiate into any type of cell in the body. And then a progenitor cell is derived from a stem cell. And a neural cell is also then derived from a progenitor cell. So you have a progress here of a cell can become anything it wants at the stem cell stage, but then it becomes slightly more differentiated into a progenitor cell and then it comes further differentiated into a stem cell and that stem cell will give rise to neurons and glia. Um, and then of course there'll be other cells in the body, new skin, muscles, everything uh, originally begins from an undifferentiated stem cell. So here is an example of a stem cell, uh, unique ability for self renewal. And then here's a progenitor cell. Okay, the progenitor cell can become either a neuroblast or a glioblast. And neuroblasts become neurons, and glioblasts become glial cells. And so here at this neuroblast or glioblast stage is when the cells would start to become either a neuron or a glioblast. And at this stage here is also when they are specialized. So an interneuron is different than a pyramidal neuron and a oligodendroglial cell is a different from an astrocyte. But all of these different types of neurons and glioblasts glial cells, all of these different types of neurons and glial cells begin here with a stem cell. So a big question is how do stem cells know what to become? Because if you've, I'm sure you've heard of stem cell research and so stem cells can turn into any cell and so sometimes it's actually possible to um, access a stem cell and try to put it into say a brain region that is deficient, that has a number of neurons that are died, and so that you can try to make new neurons for that cell. Because recall that the nerves or neurons in the central nervous system do not regenerate. Nerves or neurons in the peripheral nervous system, they do regenerate. But if you're trying to combat brain damage or spinal cord injury, then you're going to need to figure out how to come up with new cell, new neurons for the central nervous system. So one possible path is through stem cells. And so people have tried to put stem cells into regions of the brain to see if they would sort of assimilate and create new cells. And sometimes it's worked and sometimes it hasn't. But a big open question is how do stem cells know what to become? One of the factors that influences gene expression during the development is methylation. Methylation basically will tell the body, okay, what genes should be coded and what genes should not be coded. Okay, so here's a methyl group and it would block transcription. And so stress can actually reduce methylation. So if then it can reduce the number of blocks that would be put up here. And so you can have the transcription of DNA that you wouldn't want to, or you would have gene expression that you wouldn't necessarily want to. Another factor that influences the growth of stem cells is a neurotrophic factor. A neurotrophic factor is a chemical compound that acts to support growth and differentiation in developing neurons. And so neurotrophic factors may help keep certain neurons alive in adulthood. So you can have an epidermal growth factor and this would um, tell a stem cell to turn into a progenitor cell. And you can have basic fibroblast, fibro 
blast growth factors, and this could tell, for example, a progenitor cell to turn into a neuroblast. And so you'd have these particular compounds that would uh, arrive at certain times that would tell the cell what to turn into. So here's the overall stages of brain development. You have cell birth, with it, which is neurogenesis and gliogenesis. You have cell migration, okay, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Cell differentiation, cell maturation. Um, so the cells would mature and they would develop dendrites and they would have, they would grow axons that would connect with each other. Then you have synaptogenesis, and again, the synapses can only form once cells start to connect with each other. And then you're going to have cell death and synaptic pruning. You have basically more neurons and glial cells than you would need. So you're going to go start to go through and prune to keep the ones that are working the best and that are uh, that have the strongest connections. And then you have myelinogenesis, which is the formation of myelin to help the... Uh, connections between the forming neurons be strong and quick. So cell birth, this occurs seven weeks to five months in utero, and in the hippocampus it continues forever. Cell migration, this is radial and glial guide um, seven to 14 weeks in utero. So here, for example, is a picture where again, here's your ventricular zone, and again, this is where the stem cells occur. So they're going to start to differentiate here, and then they're going to migrate out, okay? So here's the subventricular sub zone where they're made, okay? And here's your migrating neuron. So it actually moves out here, okay, into this primitive cortex area. And some of them will have, um, will start to have um, connections that go sideways. So this migrating neuron, it's getting into the place where it wants to be, and then after that, it will di differentiate itself. So cell differentiation is excess, essentially complete by birth. So the latter stages of pregnancy include um, extensive cell differentiation, and that the different cells are turn into neurons, and then they're going to mature and grow. Synaptogenesis is going to start to form. And here, is an example of neural, neuronal generation, migration, and differentiation in about nine weeks. So here's conception, about nine weeks to birth. And so this is really interesting because here in about sort of the, I guess you could say about seven to 18 weeks, you have, or about seven to 16 weeks, you have extensive neurogenesis. Here's where all of your neurogenesis occurs. And then after neurogenesis begins, you start to have neuronal migration. And then you have differentiation, so they start to, they've migrated, they start to differentiate themselves, and here they just start to mature. They're going to start to connect with each other. And it is in particular um, after neuronal migration and the differentiation and into differentiation and maturation that the brain weight is going to go up and the body weight is going to go up. So interestingly here at the time of birth you still have neuronal maturation going on but you have almost no more neurogenesis. So it's just the maturing of neurons and you're still going to have increases in body weight and brain weight at this time because as neurons grow and mature, they're going to have form more connections. And so as they form more connections, they're going to be larger. And if they're larger, then of course, then you're going to have deeper cortical fo folds and you're going to have an increase in brain weight. So neural maturation is characterized primarily by dendritic growth. So you're going to grow dendrites to provide surface area for synapses with other cells. Okay. And here is, for example, a newborn. And then here you go from age one month to 24 months. And you can see how the number of neurons has stayed relatively constant. But what has expanded dramatically is the dendritic growth and how these neurons are connecting with each other and other neurons. So dendritic growth, dendritic growth is very slow. And you can have micromillimeters, um, micrometers per day. And you also have axonal growth. So the neurons extend their axons to appropriate targets to initiate synapse formation. 
And you can see that here, where you'd see here is a neuron, and it's moving, and the axons are going to be moving even farther to try to connect with each other. Here is an axon, and here's a growth cone. So when these axons grow, they actually send out these little growth cones with these fallopedia that try to detect other neurons and where they should be connecting so st to start to establish connections with other neurons. And if they find one and they start to connect with each other and they work, then you'll have the formation of synapses. So synaptic development you have 10 to the 14th synapses. This is an amazing amount. Okay, this is uh, 100,000 trillion in the adult human brain. So think then about what we've covered so far in terms of what happens at a synapse. The release of neurotransmitters, of how synapses can change as a function of experience, and you have 100,000 trillion of those in your brain. There's a combination of genetic programming and environmental cues and signals at all stages of synaptic development. Um, by the fifth gestational month, you're going to have very simple synaptic contacts. By the seventh gestational month, then you're going to have synaptic development of deep cortical neurons. So see, these are some of the things that are going to be essential for fundamental early stages of cognition. And then after birth, synaptic development increases rapidly during the first year of life. So it is very, very critical, especially during the first year, that a baby has a secure, comforting, um, enriching environment in which they can experience synaptic growth and development. In particular, in the visual cortex, density almost doubles from two to four months because at this time, then, the child can take in visual information, how much information they take in from the time of birth and at two months they have greater visual acuity and they really start to respond. So there's just a huge, huge increase in synaptic development at that time. What also happens shortly after birth is that you have selective cell death and synaptic pruning. So the brain chisels away pieces by using cell death and synaptic pruning. And that this is not the negative cell death that is associated with growing old. This is the fine-tuning that would be associated with earlier development. So this chisel, what would it be? It could be a genetic signal, it could be experience, it could be reproductive hormones, and it could even be stress. So of course their um, aspects of synaptic pruning are negative, but synaptic pruning as a process is something that is positive. It basically means that the strongest connections survive to influence development and growth. So the cortex becomes measurably thinner in a caudal rostral, sort of a back to front gradient, a process that is, that is most probably due to synaptic pruning. So a really good way to think of synaptic pruning is basically a form of neural Darwinism. So the cells are competing for a limited amount of resources. And there's the hypothesis that cell death and synaptic pruning are like natural selections in species, the outcome of competition among neurons for connections and metabolic resources in a neural environment. So the strongest neurons are going to survive, the neurons with the strongest connections. And in a sense, that's what you would want. You would want your early developing brain to be based on your strongest neurons. Apoptosis. Apoptosis is a term that refers to genetically programmed cell death. So this is something that can occur at particular times in development. Then, um, okay, when you say, well, this cell has been genetically programmed to die. This is also something that can be investigated in an older age. But really, on the whole, the main message that you want to take away here is that just like if you were to try to have a really healthy tree or a really healthy bush or really healthy garden, then you're going to need to do some trimming. But if it gets really overgrown, then it's really not going to work so well. And so your brain does this as it's developing. It prunes. It goes through and keeps the connections that are the strongest and chisels away at pieces that are not so strong. And so the surviving neurons are the ones that are the strongest, they have the strongest connections, and they are best 
they are in the best possible position to provide the strongest neural framework for your growth and development into adulthood. So in addition to neural development, you also have glial development. The birth of astrocytes and oligodendrocytes begins after most of neurogenesis is complete, and glial development also continues throughout life. Oligodendria form myelin in the central nervous system, and myelination provides a useful rough index of cerebral maturation. And here's an example. So you have total volume of the brain. I believe that the red is male and the purple is female. And so here you have total volume, you have gray matter volume, and you have white matter volume. And this is an age. 7 to 19. And so one of the things that you'll notice here is that these peaks occur at different times. And so the peaks for men and women occur at different times. The peak in total volume is earlier for uh, women than men. Uh, the peak in gray matter volume is earlier for women than men. This may contribute aspects of idea that women mature a little bit earlier than men. There's, there's some scientific evidence to support that and some not. So it's on the whole, it's mixed. It's not that women do mature in every way earlier than men. And then here you see white matter volume. And white matter, again, is connectivity. So you can have continuing strengthening of connectivity. And this does not have a peak at any time in development. Myelination is going to occur primarily with white matter. And so uh, myelination, of course, is axons, axons form white matter. And so this myelination tends to rise throughout the course of development to illustrate the better connectivity that arises from experience. So the frontal lobe is the last brain region to mature and maturation extends far beyond age 20. So the frontal lobe is especially sensitive to epigenetic influences and the trajectory of frontal lobe development correlates with adult intelligence. In this class, the vast majority of you, your frontal lobe is still developing. And the fact that your frontal lobe is still developing is one of the main reasons why there are particular behaviors that are really, really harmful for children as opposed to adults. So uh, certain types of drugs are not at all approved for use of children because it can affect the development of your frontal lobes. Alcohol, drug use, these all have profoundly different effects on the developing brain than the brain of adults.